Our God is still on his throne and ruling the affairs of man. Even as he does not change, his truths have not changed. Thankfully, God still has a people which proclaim that old-time religion setting forth his sovereignty and the old paths of truth where we can find rest for our souls. Welcome to Word of Sovereign Grace, a ministry of Paradise Primitive Baptist Church in Arlington, Texas. Get your Bible, call your friends, and sit back as we open the King James Scriptures to explore the glorious word of sovereign grace. Here's this week's message. Again, I count it a privilege to be in the house of the Lord. I, I can't think of anywhere else that I would rather be today. Not on the lake, not on the golf course, not in the shopping center, nowhere else. Um, you know, each week I briefly give you a quick synopsis of kind of where my my mind's been in the past week. I've had some good uh, conversation, some good study about uh, uh, several different uh, topics. Uh, but when it came to last night, and started looking, and then this morning, still, no, I woke up singing some off the wall rock and roll song from 40 years ago and I where did that come from well I don't know I don't think it came from the Lord uh, but as I briefly mentioned to you I think that sometimes the Lord can uh, take the hedge down and sometimes we we might let the hedge down ourselves you know give he, he says don't give place to the devil and I think that sometimes we give place to the devil we like invite him in make him a cup of tea and and uh, tell him to put his feet up and get comfortable. Uh, but a, a couple of the things, just as by way of getting the rabbits out of the way, we had a good discussion this week with with uh, Elder Holder and some others about uh, the fact that Solomon did not persevere. And the, the problem um, with everything surrounding that with some folks is to say that you've got to persevere or uh, if you don't persevere then you, you weren't a child of God to begin with you were a false professor That's some of this Calvinism business but here's what the scripture says that holy men of old were moved by the Holy Ghost to, to write so we have testimony that Solomon was a holy person uh, he penned three substantial books in the Old Testament uh, but at the end of Solomon's life, and there in 1 Kings 11, we see that he loved many strange women and he went after their gods. And I believe that, that he uh, did not repent. And this all falls back on the old Baptist doctrine. We understand that heaven and glory, immortal glory, is not dependent on the things that we do or don't do to begin with. Now, I don't advocate that we do such, but the fact of the matter is that Moses was a murderer, uh, David was a murderer, and the Apostle Paul was a murderer. I do, absolutely don't advocate doing those things. But if if glory was dependent upon how good we were, uh, we'd all be in trouble. We're not. We wouldn't make it. Thank God, it's not in accordance with our works. By grace you're saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. And there in Romans 9 and 11, you know Jacob and Esau, he says, And the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand. So it doesn't depend on what you do and what you don't do that gets you into glory. It's God's purpose according to election. It's by His grace. But however, the things that we do and don't do certainly have a reflection on how well things go for us in this life. And that's what the Lord meant when he told the children of Israel, those that were already his, you know, uh, I set before you life and death, blessing and cursing, choose life that thou mayest live and that, that thy days may be long in the land that the Lord thy God giveth thee. But he says, if you refuse and rebel, you'll be cut off and devoured by the sword. That's pretty simple. And by the way, that's not an invitation to someone that's dead in trespasses and sins to choose to accept Jesus as their Savior. It's talking, he's talking to his people. But anyway, Solomon didn't persevere. 
I don't believe that he don't believe that he repented. The judgment was passed that the kingdom would be rendered from from him, uh, not in his days, but in the life of his son. Was it Jeroboam, Jeroboam or you know, right about that same time when the renting of the kingdom, you have Jeroboam and Rehoboam, and there's a there's some uh, back and forth with all that. But anyway, the kingdom, the judgment was passed. Uh, Solomon had sinned. I don't believe that he persevered. And if you want to get into that, you can look at Lot. Uh, Lot's Lot was a person that was caught up in some some pretty bad stuff. Yet the Scripture testifies that he was righteous. Not because he had done anything good, obviously, right? <laughs> if he had any righteousness, it was because it, it was imputed to him by Christ, even though he lived on the other side of the cross. I believe that all of God's people, whether they lived on the other side of the cross, they live on this side of the cross, they're all saved the same way by the grace of God. And uh, it, there's another subject, and I brief, briefly touched on that last week or in some of my studies, uh, but it can be proven that they, they were born of the Spirit of God on the other side of the cross, just like we're born. Now, maybe not in a general fashion. It wasn't opened up in a general way, but they were still uh, born of the Spirit. Joseph is one that said they had the Spirit of God. Daniel is one that was said to have the Spirit of God. Isaac, it said in, in the New Testament, it says that Ishmael persecuted Isaac, okay, over there in Galatians 4 and 29. And he says, he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit. He says, as, as it was then, even so is it now. So that pretty much nails it for me. Uh, but there's all kinds of ideas. But anyway, I digress. Uh, the point was, the scripture teaches that we uh, should, uh, actually the word perseverance is only used one time, but the scripture teaches that we should persevere. We should seek to hold on our way to seek to continue to walk in the straight and narrow paths. But there are no guarantees that we will. And then if we don't, it doesn't mean that we're not a child of God. Okay? Another thing that we were that I was dealing with in the past week uh, was looking at um, the, the Lord destroyed the earth with a flood. Do you remember in Noah? When it talks about over there when Noah, when actually when Noah was born, uh, this, thou shalt call his name Noah, for the same shall comfort us concerning the curse which the Lord has placed upon the ground. Now that's an interesting statement to make. It's over there in Genesis chapter 5 is where you'll find that. Oh, he says, thou shalt call his name Noah, for the same shall comfort us concerning the ground which the Lord has cursed. So here it is, probably close to 1,500 years in, that they're still, they're still feeling the effects of the curse of the ground and over in Genesis uh, chapter 2, I believe it says that in sorrow it would bring forth. The ground would bring forth in sorrow. In other words, it was a big job in order to cultivate and till the ground because of the thorns and the thistles and all the things that are brought forth. So here it is at the time of Noah, uh, right about 1,500 years in, if, if I've got my math correct, uh, that they're still feeling the effects of it. And this is a prophecy, prophecy saying, the same shall comfort us concerning the curse. Now, not them directly talking about mankind. Then over there in Genesis 8, when the Lord, uh, when the waters are abated, they come out of the ark. Uh, Noah offers a sacrifice. By the way, the animals were not just two by two. The clean, some of the clean animals were by sevens that were brought on. They were brought on for sacrifices so they could later be sacrificed. But, uh, after Noah offered, he made an offering after they came out of the ark, and it says that it was a sweet-smelling savor in the, in, the, in, in the sight of God. Or can I say in the nostrils of God? You can look in Genesis 8. I'm kind of paraphrasing that a little bit. And he says, I will no more curse the ground which I have cursed. So now some people mistook what I was saying when I was saying that that curse had been lifted to saying that the curse of sin and death, I wasn't talking about the curse of sin and death, Ab absolutely not, that continues. And these, these actually, these same people, I asked them the question that objected to that, that I've seen them in the past talk about the garden that they have and how much joy they derive from their garden. So obviously, they're not bringing forth in sorrow, are they? They're enjoying the things. So anyway, that, that's just another, uh, another side note where I wanted to try to, to uh, 
talk this morning was from Isaiah chapter 40. Now, some say, and, and I, would, I would agree with this to an extent, that the book of Isaiah has 66 books, we know, and that it, it in a way, mirrors the 66 books of the Bible. You find that the Old Testament ends by saying, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. So the Old Testament kind of ends in a curse. And you see a shift in the New Testament to something completely different that's taking place. This is the beginning of, of the Reformation period. And <clears throat> so some people think that the shift of language between Isaiah chapter 39 and Isaiah 40, that there were, because the language changes so drastically, that there had to have been two different Isaiahs or as what's known as the Deutero-Isaiah theory. Well, the Lord himself dispels that because he quotes from both sides of, of chapter 40 and says that Isaiah wrote it. And I believe it's the one and the same. But this, the 40th chapter, would, be, would correlate to the 40th book of the Bible, which would be Matthew. And Matthew, you've got some wondrous things that are taking place. One of the things that we know, that's the proclamation of the angel that comes to Mary. He says, Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Behold, I bring you glad tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. Now, that's some good news. And, and that's kind of the way that Isaiah starts out here in chapter 40. He says, Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, saith your God. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she hath received of the Lord's hand double for all of her sins. That's good news right there. He says, first of all, he's saying speak comfortably to God's people. Jerusalem now is not necessarily uh, over in Palestine or we're over there in Israel, but it's talking about the new Jerusalem. That that came down from God out of heaven, or that Jerusalem which is above is, is free and is the mother of us all. That's what Paul says in the book of Galatians. But speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem. And I, I thank God that there are times that we feel that we have the liberty to do that. But that doesn't mean that's the only thing that we ever preach to God's people. Sometimes uh, he says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. For doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Sometimes the word of God needs to be preached for correction. But here he's talking about speaking comfort to God's people. And th this is comforting to me to know that our warfare is accomplished. Now think about that a minute. How many of God's people are out in the world right now laboring, uh, trying, thinking that, They've got to just be good enough. They've got to measure up. They've got to, you know, do all these things in order to maintain their eternal salvation. That is a heavy burden to, to carry. Thank God the good news is that we're saved by grace. And grace means that's the free and unmerited favor of God from a, uh, from a um, superior to an inferior. And God is definitely superior to us, and we are most definitely inferior to God because of, on account of sin. Well, that's the good news, and that's comforting, in, that's comforting to me to know that it's by grace because there was a time, and I'm sure probably in your own lives, where you thought that you just, you know, you just had to try to do good enough to measure up so that you can, you know, so you can make sure that when it's all said and done, that heaven and immortal glory is your home. See, that's what these Calvinists are getting into with all this perseverance stuff. You've got to continue to measure up. But the fact of the matter is that no man can ever measure up except the man Jesus Christ. He was the only one that could ever measure up. Why? Because he had no sin. But you and I will never measure up, so to speak. And by the way, that's what the law would do. That's what the law was brought in for, to show us that sin, that we might see sin, and we might understand that we are sinners. The, the law was never designed that if you kept it all, that would, it would make you perfectly righteous, because no man could ever keep the law. 
you offend in one point, you're guilty of all of it. Now, the, the law was to show us that we actually, that we would, could not measure up to God's standard. <clears throat> but here, here he tells them, comfort ye, comfort ye my people. The people of God. Who are, who are God's people? Well, you know the Lord knows who they are. He says the foundation of God standeth sure having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are His. Now we might get confused about a lot of things and people might try to confuse us, but God never gets confused. He knows who His people are and He's known them uh, from the foundation of the world because their names were penned in that Lamb's Book of Life. He knows exactly who they are. And those are, and by the way, this is another thing that I got into a uh, discussion with someone. Uh, I, we were talking about about Solomon and Solomon persevering or not persevering or having repented or not repented. And the person says, you can't judge. You can't judge to say that anybody's going to heaven, heaven in a moral glory. Well, wait a minute. Yes, I can, and I'm going to, because I believe I'm talking to the people of God this morning. If I didn't believe that, I'd be out of here. You know, how ignorant is that? You can't judge. Well, he says, and John says, these things have I written to you that you might know that you have eternal life. And if someone is manifesting the fruits of the Spirit, and when Jesus said, by their fruits you shall know them, I'm going to believe that I'm talking to children of God. How ludicrous is it to think that I, well, I'm, I'm preaching to people in an unknown state for an, for an unknown destination. That just doesn't make good nonsense. I believe that you're the people of God, and I believe that He's purchased you with His own blood, and you're His, you're His possession, and He's coming back to get you again someday, and He's going to take you home to glory. Yes, I believe that I'm... Now, on the other hand, now there is something to this. On the other hand, I'm not going to say, well, uh, I see you behave in a particular way, and that you're not a child of God, and you're going to hell. Absolutely not going there. Not going there. You know why? Because even a child of God can get in the flesh just like an unregenerate person can. You better believe they can. That's what Paul meant. He said, when I would do good, he says, evil is present with me. So I'm not going to make that judgment to say that. I'm not going to say that anybody's going to hell because I don't know. But if you're manifesting the fruits of the Spirit of God, I believe I'm, and if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, that he's God manifest in the flesh, you're one of his. I'm going to believe it. Now, could I be deceived or fooled? Absolutely I can be. But you know what? I'm going to err on the side that you're a child of God. If, if, that, if that is error, that's the way I'm going to go with it. I'm not going to get in the position of not knowing who it is that I, I believe that I'm preaching to or ministering to. I believe that you're children of God and you're His. And, and He has a desire to feed you with knowledge and understanding and to comfort you. Why? Because He loves you. Why? Now that I don't know. <laughs> and I, I don't think any of us really know why the Lord would love somebody like me or even like you. And I'm not talking down on you. It's just that I know that you're a sinner just like I am. Why would the Lord love somebody? But he says, speak comfort to him. And it's comfort to know that he would, he would just as Isaiah 40 correlates with Matthew chapter 1, we find the birth of the Son of God. That he came into this world to save his people from their sins. And by golly, he did it. He didn't try to save his people. He did it. He finished the work that God gave him to do and he secured eternal salvation for every single one. And not a, not one will be lost. That's comforting to me. That's good news. That's, that's the glad tidings. That's what the gospel is supposed to be about. The, the glad tidings of, of the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, we don't serve a God that has to be carried. You know, you hear people say, well, you need to carry carry Christ to the heathen. No, you don't need to carry Christ to the heathen. The Lord's already there. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere present, nowhere absent. Look at Psalm 139 if you want to get the details of that. And the, and the Lord does not need to be carried. 
that reminds me of that the golden calf over there in Mount Sinai that had to be carried, right? All oh, those false gods have to be carried. But our God does not have to be carried. I don't know where that comes from or who that's for, but take it for what it's worth. But he says, you comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, saith your God. This is, is what God is telling his ministry to do. To speak comfortably to them in regard that her warfare is accomplished. What war is that? Now, don't mistake this. We have some battles that we still fight. But, but the warfare between sin, death, hell, the grave, and the devil, it's done. It's, it's legally, it's done. It's completed. When Christ rose victorious and he came out of that grave, he, led, he said he led captivity captive and he gave gifts unto men. The devil's defeated. And you know what he says in the book of Revelation? It says, Woe to the inhabitants of the earth, for the devil's coming down having great wrath, for he knows that he has but a short time. So who's the devil worried about? Is, is he worried about those that are in the honky-tonks or those that are out, you know, in, living in the drug scene and all that? Is he worried about them? No, because he's got them right where he wants them. Who is he concerned about? The scripture says that he has come to make war against the saints of God. Now, you may not think so, but you're, if you're a child of God, you're considered a saint of God. Okay? It doesn't mean, you know, some, some different order, say, after, you know, somebody died 50 years ago, now they're elevated and to sainthood. No, 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 that's not what it's talking about. You are the saints of God. Why? Because you're precious in his sight. In so much that he was even willing to give his life for you. Now, even like I say, we don't understand it. I think now we see through a glass darkly. But the time's coming that we'll understand it. But now, we're, we're not, because of, the, because of the limitations of the flesh and the nature of the flesh, there's some things the Lord's just not going to reveal to us right now. He says in one place, I have much more to say to you, but you can't bear it. And that goes both ways. But he says, your warfare is accomplished. Many of God's people, it kind of it kind of gets me. Uh, we traveled to my son's house. He lives in Willow Park. And there's a big billboard of a particular church in the area. It says, a church on an eternal mission. Now, that just about turns my stomach. You know why? Because that tells me they think by what they're doing, they're helping God populate heaven. And that's one of the biggest lies that the devil's per 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 perpetuated or said or done or told. I think that he's in, the, in modern church era. No church is on an eternal mission. Because that means that, well, God needs my help. God needs our help. You know, all these people are dying and going to heaven because we haven't reached them with our puny uh, our puny efforts. I don't believe that. I believe our God is greater than that. I, I believe because our God elected His people before the foundation of the world and that He predestinated them to be conformed to the image of His Son and He's, he's uh, uh, predestined, called, justified, and glorified His people. They will live in glory whether they ever hear a gospel message or not. And that's one of the purposes of the gospel. You know what this, you know what this book is for? This is sheep food. Can I say it like that? It's sheep food. He says, I'll give you pastors according to my own heart, which will feed you with knowledge and understanding. That's what the gospel does. It, it gives, brings life and immortality to light. It helps to manifest what the Spirit of God is already doing on the inside. It doesn't give you eternal life. It helps to manifest the fact that you have it. It gives you knowledge and understanding. It, it it brings, helps you to, uh, to believe. And God's people need to believe His book. We find comfort in believing the book. Even though I don't, I don't claim to understand it all. Right? Just because I don't understand it all doesn't mean I don't believe it. I believe it. I believe every word of this book even though I don't understand it. You should too. You comfort my people, saith your God, and speak comfortably to Jerusalem and cry unto her. That He said, cry unto her. He didn't whisper it. 
We need to cry aloud, cry aloud to God's people. Why are you going about to labor to try to secure your eternal life when the Lord's already done it? Enter into the rest of God. He says that in the book of Hebrews that we should labor to enter into His rest. <laughs> if we want to work, that's where we need to work. <laughs> to try to, to let, let's work to the point to where we can retire, so to speak. <laughs> okay? And it, it is work uh, to have to undo all the baggage that we learn in the world. It's work. Uh, we have to cast off all uh, the, the burdens and all the, the wrong yokes that we take up upon ourselves uh, to enter into that rest of Christ. And that means that he says in what I think he says in one place that we cease from our labors just as he ceased from his labors. Now, it doesn't mean that we don't have to work in the kingdom, but the, the purpose for our work is not to try to get ourselves into glory. The purpose of our work is that the reason that we do keep his commands is because we love the Lord. And from a motive of gratitude and thankfulness we do we keep his commands. Not so we can you know, get another notch in the, or any of that kind of stuff. It's because we love the Lord. That's why we serve the Lord. I'm thankful for what He's done for me. And I trust that you are too. You realize that He's saved you and He's, he's pulled you out of the miry clay. He's lifted you out of the pit and He set your feet upon a rock and you're thankful for that. That's why you serve God. Not so you can get into heaven. Oh, but many of God's people are still, they're missing that rest. This is comfort to enter into the rest of God. Jesus, you know when he was hanging on the cross, one of the last things he said, it's finished. He repeated that in John chapter 17 for our edification and understanding I finished the work which I was given me, which I was given me to do. Let me go over there. Put my bookmark here. John chapter seventeen. This is the Lord's prayer, by the way. What you find in the book of Matthew is the model prayer. Uh, here he says, These words spake Jesus and lift up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son may also glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. That's the exact population of heaven, by the way. That's exactly how many are going to be in glory. As many as thou hast given unto me, or is thou is given unto him, unto Christ. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which has sent me, that of all which he hath given me I should lose nothing, but raise it up again at the last day. Now what does that mean? If to be raised again, that means you had to been raised the first time. I'm not very smart, but I know if you're raised again, you had to be raised the first time. And you're raised the first time when you're uh, quickened from a, a state of death and trespasses and sins to a life in Christ. And you're born again of the Spirit of God. That's the first resurrection, brothers and sisters. And you will be raised again at the last day. Regardless of what happens between then and the end of your life, Paul says that nothing is able to separate you from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. He says, neither life nor death, principalities, powers, things present, things to come, nor any other creature can separate you from that love. That's comfort. That's good news to know. But it, as many as thou hast given him, and he says, and this is eternal life, that they may know thee, the only true God, in Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. The Lord finished it. Now he didn't say, well, it's finished um, if they'll if accept me or if they'll repent or if they'll be baptized. You know, it's hard for some people to grasp the fact is that you can that God can save you before you repent. Isn't that interesting? Some people have a hard time with that, but you know what? Repentance is a work. 
Baptism is a work. Belief is a work. Absolutely. Look over in John chapter 6 and he says as much that this is the work of God that you believe. Twofold on that. Another subject. Yes, you're saved not in accordance with your works. Repentance is a work. Belief is a work. Baptism is a work. Accepting Christ is a work. Uh, I use this illustration quite often. I use it again this morning. Acceptance of Christ. Do you think that's a good fruit or is that an evil fruit? That's well, a good fruit, isn't it? It's it's a good. We need to we need to come to accept Christ as our Lord and Savior, but not in order to become children, but because we are His children, right? But acceptance of Christ is a good fruit. Now, what kind of tree does a good does good fruit come off of? Jesus said, "A good fruit bringeth a good tree bringeth forth good fruit. An evil tree bringeth forth evil fruit." He says, "A good tree cannot bring forth corrupt fruit." Neither can an evil tree bring forth good fruit. So if it's good fruit, it comes from what? A good tree. So if accepting, if you accept Christ as a good fruit, it means that you're already a good tree. Because a good fruit cannot come from an evil tree. Does that make sense? Did I explain that right? Will you understand that? Good fruit comes from a good tree. And then again, <clears throat> an apple doesn't pop into midair and the tree grow in under it. The tree comes first, then the fruit. Galatians 5.22, and he tells you what the fruit of the Spirit is, the ninefold fruit. So that, that uh, fruit comes from a good tree. So if you accept Christ, it's an evidence of truly from your heart. You, you accept Him as your Lord and Savior. It's evidence that you're already a child of God. You do not do it to become a, a child of God. It's impossible. Man that's dead in trespasses and sins. Um, he said, The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. They're foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. So a man is in a state of nature will not accept Christ. He won't come to Christ. And as a matter of fact, the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. Right? So, but Jesus said, I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Good news. Good news. There's a, a couple of other places that I wanted to go. But he says, Tell a cry unto Jerusalem, tell her that her warfare is accomplished. Yes, indeed, the Lord is risen victorious over the devil. And that's he said, this is one of the reasons that the Son of, Son of God was manifest, to destroy the works of the devil. And he's done it legally. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. And we'll see that the Lord is patient. The Lord is, has, is, uh, has long patience for the fruit of the earth. He's, he's waiting for his children to be born. He has, he's long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish. All right? uh, the Lord is long suffering to us. And over there in uh, Romans 9, he talks about it again, about the vessels of mercy and the vessels of wrath. So the, the Lord is patient. The Lord is waiting. Uh, it's all is well. The Lord, the, the devil's defeated. He knows he has a short time. Um, and it's legally all been done, just practically. The, the last thing to do is for God to destroy it, him practically. And that's going to take place at the end of time. But he says, speak comfortably to Jerusalem, tell her her warfare is accomplished. Now that's not the same thing as the battle that we have to fight. That war, Eternal salvation settled. Just, just get that in your mind. Eternal salvation is settled. What's not settled is the battle that we have to fly, fight the spirit against the flesh to bring our bodies into subjection, right? That's the fight that we have to fight every day, okay? That is why we need the grace of God. That is why we need the spirit of God. That's why we need the leadership of the spirit of God. That's why we need to read God's book. That's why we need to come out and be separate uh, so, so that we can fight this battle between the flesh and the spirit. That one's not done. We fight it. We're going to have to fight it. Paul talks about I die daily. Every day. Every day we're going to have to fight that one. But eternal, get it in your head, eternal salvation settled. The Lord has forever settled that for his children. 
He says, tell her that her iniquity is pardoned. Isn't that, isn't that good news? Your sins are pardoned. You know, that one of the last things that a president usually does when he leaves office, he starts pardoning people. This is, this is, a, this is not the same, same thing. <laughs> Those people are pardoned and they're still, some of them are pardoned and they're still rotten crooks. Right? <laughs> Here the Lord is, uh, our, our iniquity has been pardoned. Not, uh, not only has it been put away uh, as far as east is from the west, but we have the imputed righteousness of Christ. Uh, not the same thing when a president pardons someone. I just so you were wondering about that. For she has received double of the Lord's hand for all her sins. Now, I want you to think about this for a minute. Here's, remember that parable of the man that owed 10,000 talents and he didn't have anything to pay and the Lord freely forgave him. You're forgiven. And he went out and found somebody that owed him five pence or something. I can't remember. Just a, somebody that owed him a few dollars and said, you pay me. And he began to choke him and said, you pay me everything that you owe me. The man just forgetting that he has been, been forgiven a great debt. Yet he turned around, somebody that owed him just a few bucks and wanted to have him cast in jail. Well, the Lord wasn't very happy with that. But here, here's what I want you to see is that we owed a great debt and the Lord freely forgave us. Right? We owed a great debt that we couldn't repay. We could never repay it. And the Lord stepped in and paid it on our behalf when he shed his blood on Calvary's cross. All right? And not only that, not only that, that's one part of, part of this uh, she hath received of the Lord's hand double. That's one thing that the Lord... He died for undeserving creatures. Even, he says, even when we were alienated in our minds by wicked works, that he died for us. Now, that's love. That's one thing. He died for us when we were undeserving, unworthy creatures. Yet, not only that, he's called us gospelly. And he's given us access. He said we can come boldly, to the throne of grace and find mercy and grace and help in time of need. And we have access to the storehouse of heaven when he, in Philippians 4 and 19 when he says, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory. It's like, okay, he paid this great debt for us. Then he turns around and he dumps all the riches of glory right in our lap. That's double. That's double. Now, if there's another interpretation for that, I'd like to hear it. But that's, that's, that falls in line with the comfort. So here you are, you're, you dirty, low-down, rotten scoundrels, don't deserve nothing. He died for you, he paid your debt, and then he wrote you a big check to put it in your bank account. The problem is, a lot of God's children aren't drawing on that bank account. They spend more time worrying and fretting over things than they do drawing on, he says, where your, um, what does he say, lay up for yourself treasure in heaven? That's not, it's not talking about for after this life. It's talking about for now. If, for great is your reward where? In heaven? Is that talking about we get rewards after this life? Absolutely not. You get your reward in heaven. You better draw on it now. Because there's not going to be a reward there in heaven because a reward is repayment for service rendered. In heaven, it's a, it's, heaven is an inheritance. And he says... It, that in Romans chapter 8, that we're heirs and joint heirs with Christ. We're not rewarded in, after this life. We're rewar our reward in heaven is now, where we can walk in the kingdom of God and we can eat and drink at his table in his kingdom, enjoy the good things of the riches of Christ. And we're made uh, from time to time to sit together in heavenly places in Christ. That's comfort. <coughs> We need to come into the kingdom and enjoy these things. I want to just drop down to the last part of uh, chapter 40, about verse 31. A lot of things said in between, and there's a lot of things in between when we're born of the Spirit of God and we enter into glory. But here's, one, here's some encouragement. I trust will be for you this morning. He says, but they, oh, let me go ahead and there's a semicolon there. Let me back up. Verse 29. 
He giveth power to the faint. And to them that have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. The key to this is they that wait upon the Lord. You know, a lot of times we, we want everything. We want it right now. We want it done our way, don't we? But here he's saying, they that wait upon the Lord, your strength will be renewed. Where is your strength to, to begin with? It's in Christ. Paul says we have no confidence in the flesh. There's no, there's no strength. What Paul says in, uh, when he besought the Lord to remove that thorn that he had in his flesh, and he says, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. And recognizing your weakness, your inability, uh, you cry out to the Lord, and, and that's where you truly find your strength is in Him. Not in yourself. So, you wait upon the Lord, you'll renew your strength. God does things in His own time. Not mine, not yours, not anyone else's. I believe that. But we have to be patient. We have to, That's what he's saying here. Wait upon the Lord. You know, I, I can think of an example that the, the Lord, you think about this, faithful Abraham. You think, well, there, there's not another besides the Lord himself that was ever so faithful. But you know what? The Lord promised, he says, Sarah shall conceive and bring forth a son. And you know what faithful Abraham did? He wanted to help God out, so he, he got with Hagar. <laughs> right? Right? He didn't want to wait. He, you can consider the fact that it was a miraculous birth when Isaac was born. But here's Abraham, knowing what God had promised, wanted to help God out, and he got him a bondwoman. When he said, specifically, Sarah shall conceive and bear a son, even though she was 90 years old. Think that's an impossibility? Well, maybe Abraham, maybe faithful Abraham was doubting some there. Well, you know, here it is. God's promised this. If he had a watch, maybe he had a sundial on his wrist there he's looking at, right? Well, you know, God sure promised that. Uh, I, I better help the Lord out some. And that's actually, that's kind of what he did. All right? And because of it, there was trouble because of that. <laughs> but anyway, Sarah eventually did conceive at God's time and God's way. All right? Even though she was 90 years old, she still conceived. All right, anyway, but you wait upon the Lord, you'll renew your strength, mount up with wings as eagles. That means you can soar to the heights. Soar to the I used to have dreams all the time when I was young about flying. I don't, I don't know if that's just something about being young. Every once in a while, I'll still have those. I don't like heights. I don't like getting much higher than, you know, up, what is it, foot and a half or two foot up here. Um, I even see that commercial on TV, that girl, that credit card commercial climbing to the top of that peak, and I get weak behind the knees, you know. But if the Lord's bearing you up, if the Lord lifts you up, that's different. He said, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that He may exalt you in due time. And let the Lord lift you up, and that's a good place to be. But He says, you wait upon the Lord, you renew your strength, your strength is the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll mount up with wings as eagles, you'll run and you won't be weary, and you'll walk and not be faint. I can't run the way I used to. I used to be, um, I guess when I was full grown, uh, back before I quit drinking and smoking, I was 115 pounds, soaking wet. And I could run. I could run then. And, and, and I, I didn't get tired. I, could, I try to run now. I could run about 75 feet and I'm just give out. But you know, the Lord, what, what I'm saying in all this is that the Lord will give us the strength that we need to walk the walk and, and, and to run the race that He's placed us in. Look to Him. Look to him, look, rest in his finished work, understand eternal salvation settled, 
Now that the reason that you that you serve the Lord is because of how great things that He's done for you. And like He told that wild Gadarene, go home. He wanted to follow the Lord. He said, no, go home and tell your friends how great things the Lord has done for you. That's what we need to be doing. We need to be telling others how great things the Lord has done for us. We're tremendously blessed people. We've got life and breath. We've got our. We generally have our good health. Uh, we have one another. We have many blessings. And I, I challenge you that if you're concerned about your blessings, stop and count your blessings. You begin. If you want to make a list of pros and cons, and if you be honest, you cannot count all the blessings that God has bestowed upon you all through your life. He's kept you from day one till now, and he's not going to forsake you. He said, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. I thank you for your good attention. As we stand and sing a suitable hymn, there's one or more that has a desire to unite with this body. Word of Sovereign Grace, a ministry of Paradise Primitive Baptist Church in Arlington, Texas. Paradise Primitive Baptist Church is located at 5300 Mansfield Road in Arlington, Texas. Services begin at 1030 each Sunday morning. Plan to come and worship with us. To find out more about Paradise Primitive Baptist Church, visit www.paradisepbc.org. Be sure to visit our website for articles, video, and audio sermons, as well as biblical answers to your questions. Thanks for watching, and be sure to join us again next week. May God richly bless you.